Technology yeah. wants what the technology gets. <laughs> to that elusive, uh, the heart wants what the heart wants. Well, <laughs> does the technology get what it wants, though? That's We certainly don't always get what we want from it. No. it but does it have agency? Yes, yes. <laughs> it certainly has a degree of it. So how are you? I am uh, pretty good. It's pretty quiet here. We go into curfew at, uh, I think it's nine o'clock and we just hit nine o'clock here. So it's, it's all quiet, which is going to make Christmas very different from last year when there was some sort of electronic uh, festival about uh, a kilometer away from me that I could hear very clearly until like uh, on New Year's Eve until two in the morning. So very strange sort of thing. Uh, I had my biggest culture shock last year because there was never a moment when the Georgians have a, you know, the night before Christmas and everything's quiet. I mean, in New York City, everything got totally quiet on Christmas Eve, hmm. you know. But here, you see the the Orthodox have their service. It starts around nine and then goes to around four or five in the morning. It's hardcore. So just the religious people do that. The other people treat it kind of like almost a carnival. And so you don't get that same sense. There are Christmas, Western Christmas decorations up, but it doesn't feel the same. Interestingly enough, here are the Western Christmas decorations you will never see here. You see all sorts of bulbs and lights and icicles and candy canes, things like that. Uh, Santa's occasionally, but no angels, no Jesus, in a, a, no nativity scene. Oh. All those would be forbidden by the church, probably. How much, how much power does the church have, or is it, and what kind of power is it? Uh, it's pretty serious. It, I mean, when I say this is an Orthodox country, I mean that in a very literal way. Even the people here who aren't Christians are all kind of it's, there's an umbrella of what the country is that it includes orthodoxy. And it's one of the highest uh, proportions of, you know, faithful churchgoers to uh, in any population. You know, it's high, certainly higher than America, although there's probably some southern states that are about the same level. But uh, what, what kind of level are you talking about? 40, 50 percent? No, uh, I'm talking probably... 50, 60 percent oh, really? in terms of who claim something. Okay. Now, supposedly it's 80 percent of people who claim to be Orthodox Christians here. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, my observation is there's an awful lot of nominal Christians. Yeah. But even among the people I've met here who are the most uh, secular, most uh, westward looking and such, uh, they, I haven't found any of that super, um, super, uh, what, what is the word? Well, antagonistic uh, sense that you get now in the West. Uh, in a sense, it's much more like it was when I was young, which when I was young, there was always a deference paid to Christmas, Christian right. things, you know, right. people would talk about missionaries and pastors and keep them right. in high regard. Right. Whereas now it's like, what you're a missionary that's like cultural you know <laughs> genocide or something you know, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's, it's just considered horrifying um to not to everybody obviously but to many people who consider themselves above such cultural uh philistinism you yeah. know although, unless, unless you're although, going overseas to uh propagate science or medicine or something like that well, then yeah, of yeah. course you're going to be a doctor yeah you know then, doctors without then, borders there exactly, you know yeah. or yeah you know, well, one thing I was thinking of doing, if you're interested in it, is I was thinking of looking at 2020 in a kind of an alternative manner. And this is the, the 2020 that I think, this is what would have been the news in 2020. That sounds <laughs> like fun. Yeah, yeah. So we'll start with a little bit of a, I figured just make it different. I wanted to kind of end the year up more or less with a, kind of looking at the country, but this will just take a few minutes and then we can talk about seriously, whatever. Uh, but okay, what do the following countries have in common? Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and this is for 2020 only, Yemen, India, Iran, 
Burundi, Somalia, Djibouti, the Republic of Congo, Kenya, Argentina, Paraguay, South Sudan, uh, and there's a, I mean, several other countries. I have no idea. They all uh, were in one way or another suffered some degree of damage from one of the largest uh, locust infestations in history. Wow. Uh, particularly in uh, Eastern Africa and in Pakistan, evidently. It just, it was like some of the worst damage they've seen in 70 years. Wow. This is like a huge, huge event. And so what I'm calling this is events few people will remember from 2020. Yeah, yeah. This is an alternative year. This is what the news would have looked like had it not been for the virus, uh, the rioting and protesting, and the election the way it was. Yeah. So uh, the Australian wildfires, I think yeah. people remember, but they uh, what people are going to forget is just how big they were. 186,000 square kilometers or 72,000 square miles. Wow. Uh, and there were 34 deaths, 5,900 structures were destroyed, and 3 billion creatures, mostly reptiles. Wow. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's just like yeah. that was like January. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. We had an impeachment of the president of the United States this year. <laughs> <laughs> what's weird about that is like no one's even going to ever remember that no 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 <laughs> just whoosh, yeah, especially, especially people who were running it i was such a political thing you know yeah. uh india had just a nightmare year this year besides uh the virus they had massive flooding they had huge cyclones they had earthquakes they had one of the most devastating heat waves in their history. I think it got up to near, al almost re breaking the Death Valley record of 130. It got up near <sighs> there. Uh, and they had the locust plague. <laughs> it's like nobody even knows. Okay, uh, how much will people remember the, the uh, wildfires this year on the West Coast? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, Californians will, again, a lot of local stuff here, but... Um... Yeah, we'll remember yeah, we'll yeah. remember them the smoke well they remember that if there's a fire every year but how big they were it's like yeah. uh let's see 74 let's see northern california i think it was a property damage of 7400 buildings plus yes. in southern california it was 1800 buildings uh and and I mean, in, in terms of the cost, uh, okay, so actually, if you, okay, and the, oh, okay, I, I added it all together. California home losses were actually 14,000. I, I made a mistake. 14,000 homes? Yeah, or structures. Structures, right. Uh, California uh, fire suppression costs were uh, 2,600,000,000. Wow. I mean, just incredible stuff. And then the Northwest had tons of stuff and the Great Basin area. Had, and when you lump it all together, it's just like incredibly huge, the fire season. Um, there were 128 cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons this year. Wow. And that included uh, over 1,200 people getting killed with over six, $60 billion in damages. Um, oh yeah, there was that Lebanese explosion thing. I don't think yeah. most people know how bad it actually was. There were 204 deaths, 6,500 injuries, uh, $15 billion in damage, and 300,000 people were left homeless. Wow. Uh, and then, uh, you know, not too far from me here, there's the Azerbaijan-Armenian right. War uh, yep. over the area called Nagorno-Karabakh. Yeah. And what yep. most people don't realize is how close Russia and Turkey came to fighting each other in that. Wow. Wow. I mean, the way it is now, there are thousands of Russian troops there, and the Turks, the Turks support the Azeris, Azeris because they are another Turkic-speaking group. And the Russians support the Armenians. Yeah, that got and you right had now, to you Ar had to dig Armenia for that news. Shattered. Yeah, Armenia is shattered. Now, they had really they got the virus really bad, and then they had this, and they basically lost 
uh, territory over it uh, in the disputed zone. So these are the kind, of, oh, and here are the things that would have happened this year. These are the kind of things people we would have talked about and argued about. Uh, although this is still coming up, you don't hear much about it. Beethoven's 250th anniversary. <laughs> It's coming up on December 17th. It'll be interesting to see if it passes with just like a blip in the news on that day. <laughs> you know, uh, the Tokyo Olympics were supposed to happen. And it was the first Olympics where they were supposed to allow transgender athletes. Can you imagine what the conversation would have been like as we led up to that? <laughs> and here's this. Imagine the elections without the pandemic. Trump would have just won easily because the economy was so good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and especially yeah. if that without the elections and without the uh, the George Floyd and other yeah protests and riots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably so, would have. Yeah, no, it's it's so, so hard. It's so hard to know. Well, it's hard. Yeah, of course, you can't say for sure because other things might have happened. But well, and, and to what degree would have the would the impeachment have been remembered? I mean, that was that wasn't even a talking point during the election. I mean, not no. even a talking no. point. Completely forgotten by them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it just you so you realize that the things that really happened this year, they have really shaken us up. If we can forget all of that stuff. Yeah. If all that stuff just goes down as, as a kind of a blip, I mean, some of it's going to be remembered. Like obviously, California is going to remember. Yeah, it was a bad, another bad fire year and stuff like that. But I mean, that's kind of a glimpse of what an alternative twenty twenty might have looked like. <laughs> well, it's always it's always so hard to know, you know, in retrospect. Oh yeah. What's what will be remembered? I mean, mm -hmm. and so much of. You know, and if you, you know, if you don't, if you read, let's say, primary sources, if you're reading history instead of just the summaries, which is most of the history we often read, but if you read primary sources, you find that there's a, I mean, you and I have talked about this before, there's a, there's a texture to our time that, yeah, obviously you can't remember everything, so things get forgotten. And, you know, part of what I like with, you know, your channel, I was listening to um, you going back over the how we get here you know mm -hmm. the differentiation in your video where you talked about the um you know the druggies <laughs> basically the druggies and the activists and yeah. and you know i was you know because you know you know my wife and i are always you know looking around for i'm always looking around for strange tv to watch because i get so sick of the the sameness of all of the new stuff they keep putting out. So oh, often yeah. I'll go back and try and find old things that I can watch. And, exactly. you know, I, 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 you know, everybody's talking about the Mandalorian. So, okay, I'll, you know, everybody's riffing on it. Religion in terms of the religion of the Mandalorian. Okay. I better take a look at that. So, but then I bumped into jungle book on Disney plus, which began mm -hmm. with a, something of a disnified trigger warning that there are stereotypes here in oh there are stereotypes in kipling's jungle book i'm horrified <laughs> this, is, this is kipling <laughs> okay <laughs> and, and just watching you know bagera and baloo and the apes and it's just like are we talking oh, the cartoon the cartoon yeah yeah oh yeah 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 great, and, great, great and just one of and, the you last know, I'm I'm old enough to remember some of that. You're old enough, a little bit older, so you can remember it better than I can. And just and and look looking at how, you know, someone someone brought up it was in I, I got it with the one video with Douthit and Stephen Smith and uh, Tara Burton, Isabel Burton, about you know witches, how witches today they look back on witches as if they were these feminist revolutionaries and of course a an, an actual scholar stood up and said no if you actually look at what the witches were asserting it was you know it was all deeply embedded within christianity <laughs> mm -hmm. and 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 are you know not only not only are we bad observers of the moment 
because it's too large. We're bad observers of 2020 because we're so wrapped up in our own um, disasters closer to home, but we're horrible observers over the past because of course that the, the combinatorial explosiveness of the moment just you know, keeps exploding when you start looking into the past. Right. And all of that past gets built into the present. And it's, yeah, so what, well, what will be remembered but, in 2020? It's really hard to know. It, well, it is indeed. One thing, uh, I, a lot of this stuff will be forgotten because it was already blown out of the water as it happened, you know? And I often think that our memories work a bit like old uh, hit rock and roll or pop radio stations used to work, which is to say they had a top 30 chart. And so you're always hoping that, you know, Led Zeppelin or the Beatles or Elton John or, you know, uh, Foreigner or somebody is going to get to the top if you were, you know, among them. But then these events would plan. What happened was eventually they would fade down the songs and then they would disappear for a while. And then some would come back as oldies. Now, if you were actually listening at the time, you'd say, hey, they haven't played that song for a long time. Or even more so, if you really... Uh, we're listening to the music at a certain time, you go like, and they, you know, uh, some group has uh, 10 hit singles or five hit singles, but they never play anything off the albums, <laughs> you know, but that's how our memory works, is that it, it's like there are these things that kind of to the top of the chart, and then things drift off, and then uh, what happens is they get buried, and then some come back and we hear them again. That doesn't mean those are the good things that come back. And that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go back and look for those deeper album cuts, so to speak. Yeah. It, but it's that, um, you know, what I'm, this list here was the album cuts from 2020, you know, it was the, it's, it's the things that, you know, uh, historians are going to look back at the stuff. Uh, people who want to understand a certain thing later when Armenia and Azerbaijan fight again, people say like, you'll have some expert who knows about this stuff. who will talk about it. If, if it's memorable, specifically if it involves the other two larger parties, which would be a major event. Yeah. And I'm sitting here going like, no, not here. Yeah, <laughs> now you're in Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're, we're kind of neither on the Turk or Russian side. So, uh, but then the West would get involved. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's, uh, but, but, you know, it's, for me, it's important to also understand how we put things into our memory and that we need to do them as honestly as possible to realize that, I mean, I think what the media does for us is it cans things. And then you, we get the can that we're watching, whether it's the news or on a YouTube video or something. And there's a tendency to remember the canned version. You know, I mean, that's how a lot of people's perception of the 60s got so distorted was because when it came out again, they've, they forgot all the stuff. So the, you know, for the civil rights movement, it kind of ends with 1965 and they're signing the bills and stuff like that. And they forget about, oh yeah, well, then all these people got killed and people remember that in a kind of nostalgic way, but they forget about all the failures of the civil rights movement that ended up creating the ghettos, which were totally different. You know, the ghettos of the 1950s compared to the ghettos of the 1970s are two completely different things. And the ghettos, the, the black sections of town had such uh, a full range of life. You know, you had your black doctors and your black lawyers, you had your black businessmen and such, but those people were all uh, able to move to better neighborhoods, leaving the poorest of the poor, which then, puts us on the road to where we got to yeah you know? yeah and uh you don't want to go back and say well you guys shouldn't have moved but at the same time oh, you don't course, want that was to the end it. of redlining now and you know and also depending on where you when you grew up so i was born in 63 and so mm -hmm. you know by 68 70 i'm starting to form memories and impressions and all of right. this of course um but but so my more vivid memories are much more of the seventies. Right. Which, which is pretty dark, <laughs> especially if you were, you were in New Jersey at that time, right? That's right. I was in Patterson. So yeah, you might as well have just been on the antechamber to the apocalypse, you know, it's like, 
<laughs> oh, and, but again, as a if you're a kid, so then there's the right. perceiver, of course. So next door to the church was the was NARC, um, Northside Addicts Rehabilitation Center. And it was mm -hmm. a halfway house full of people trying to recover from heroin addiction. And these people were in church with us on Sunday. And they were, you know, some of them, of course, were, I get so, I get so frustrated at the, so, so now where I sit and when I watch people in white communities that have very, very little experience with black communities, I, I just, and, and so what they're getting is all of this stuff from the media. And I think this is just a distortion. It's just a distortion. And, oh, yeah. and so you know, people don't understand how conservative some black folks are. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and these are <laughs> many of the, and many of the people that I minister to, these were, these were, now these are people in their seventies and eighties who grew up in the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. have been lifelong Christians, you know, some of whom voted for Trump. <laughs> and, and and there's just no understanding of the complexity of of a real community. And so, you know, these, you know, a lot of these recovering heroin addicts, you know, they love children. And so, you know, we were the preacher's kids and we were some of the few white kids in a black community. And so these were our friends. Now we were children looking up at these adults. And of course we were um, enculturated to always respect adults. We would never call an adult by the, that adult's first name. It was always Mr. Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was the culture we were raised in. And uh, these were, these were also recovering heroin addicts that were, you know, trying to stay clean and then they'd get out of the halfway house and they'd relapse right. and, you know, their life would be a mess and their um, relationships, their family relationships would be, you know, would be sort of a mess. And, you know, of course, following heroin would be AIDS. And mm -hmm. so my predominant connection with AIDS was not so much the gay community as the drug community. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but again, I saw this as a child and. Uh, well, there's a strange phenomena that goes on and it's, it's made much stranger by the rapidity with which the mass media and uh, in our times, the social media and everything turn things over. And that phenomena is that when children grow up, they tend to think the world they're looking at is the normal world. That's right. And uh, I, I'm, I've run into this with some of the uh, younger people who come to my channel. They they will often say, oh, I had no idea X, whatever it was, was not something that was something brand new when I was young. You know, that the cynicism of the 1990s was a brand new thing. Just, or, or consider someone who grows up post September 11th, their, their consciousness, which would be a millennial. Their consciousness is formed in that matrix and they tend to think everything is like, you know, drone strikes and, and uh, watch out, uh, you gotta be suspicious. We, are, we always have been going through these crazy lines at the airport and such like that. And, and, um, and now what will children who are like five years old or younger think as they enter whatever this world is gonna be? Yeah. Is it, whatever it is, is 2019 is ancient history at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not going back there. No, no. No, that's that's so true. I remember, I, I I remember experiencing the shock of learning because my parents were, I mean, in in their own Christian subculture, they were activists of sorts. I mean, they made the decision to live in a black community and minister to the black community and embed themselves in that community. And of course, in the '60s and '70s, um, so my father my, you know, my parents, my father left seminary, my mother left college in 1960. So they were, you know, you look, you go through the picture albums, you could just watch the transformations happen in style and clothing and music and mm -hmm. just watch all this happen. You watch it happen in the church. Um, but 
So, so I remember learning that the African American population was 10% of, you know, the national population. And I was old enough at that point to have an appreciation for what 10% was. And I was just, I, I mean, it was a, it was a shock to the system because that it was so low that it was so low. How could that be? I mean, that's just insane. But then I got a little older. And, and of course I had, I, I went to school in these, you know, this Dutch Calvinist subculture, but to church in this black neighborhood. And my, my house was kind of on the boundary of these changing communities. And, and then of course, when, when I would be a day camp counselor and that kind of stuff with the kids in the neighborhood, realizing that many of these, many of these children had never been two or three blocks away from the home that they lived in. You know, mm -hmm. uh, every now and then you'd have someone who had an intact enough family that they would go back home to the South for vacations. And then they would have this completely different life, which was much more rural of camping and fishing and 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 these kinds of things and so when you have church camp camp outs then some of the people older than myself who had some of that still from the from the south you know they connected and they loved the camp i mean and it, it's just well it, it's just these you know seven billion worlds that we're inhabiting that that oh, are yeah. that are that we're sharing this well, planet with right now and you can multiply it through eras of time you know, is I think one of the hardest things to do is to understand the world your parents grew up in as a, as a, as you're growing up yep. and it takes a while. I remember when, you know, my mother would like a certain kind of easy listening music. She liked people like Frank Sinatra. She liked, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I remember just hating that music because, you know, I liked rock music from the sixties and seventies and, and then there was a time in the late 80s when I started to buy some of these easy listening records. And I started to get really good at discriminating, which was a good one, which was a bad one. And uh, But what it did was it helped me to understand. I started noticing, of course, I treated these things very differently than my mother would have. But um, I noticed how many album covers show people reclining or sleeping or resting. And I said, this must have been really important to those people coming out of World War II and the Depression. And to come back and just kick back, and may have a drink, you know, there's the dog, there's the nice house, there's the woman who's, she's dressed in always kind of some weird lacy thing. It's like, she's got nothing to do. It's, well, a, it's, a way, a, it's an emblem of pride that she doesn't have to work. Exactly, exactly. Now these are just images. You know, that is to say, these are the images people were buying and, and they would buy, you know, this stuff, this lush string section and uh, all of this sort of thing. Um, but, you know, right now, it, you know, it would be, it, I've noticed among other generations, it's very hard for them to understand how the hippies and such grew up, or it's under, hard to understand what the punks were like, hard to understand what the grunge scene was like, hard to understand what the gangster rap, how the gangster rap of the 90s differs from the gangster rap of, say, 2010. You know, it's just hard to picture these worlds. But uh, I think it was Susan Sontag in her uh, essay, really interesting essay called Notes on Camp. Camp being kind of the aesthetic that predominates in, in uh, at least the older mid 20th century gay world of kind of taking things that are overly emotional and relishing the florid artificial emotionality of it. So whether it was opera or whether it was uh, any sort of uh, strange, you know, like art that was uh, just sort of, now this is partly where we also get our trash aesthetic from where people will go and buy things ironically. They were in a, in a sense, the camp aesthetic was like a proto postmodern irony, but uh, one thing she said interesting in that essay that I often remember is that one of the first things to leave any era of time is the taste of the era, mm. the, the, the what people thought was important, uh, the way people not just dressed, but how they decorated their homes and such. These things 
are so this is why it's really fascinating when someone, for instance, finds a house in Los Angeles that no one's lived in for 50 years. Yeah. Or in Paris that no one's been in for like 85 years. Yeah. Because suddenly when you walk into it, and it's totally different than the images you see in movies and television, yeah. which is our version of that. It's rare to find someone who can really reconstruct it. Yeah. But you know, it's just like it was amazing to me watching movies about the 1950s and the in the 70s and 80s. And I was sitting there going like, how come none of the kids ever have a crew cut? <laughs> you know, it was like one of the big things. Every kid had to get one, you know, it was like, but but it's that those weird little details uh, accumulate and make up uh, so much of that era. And then it starts to change, things happen. But what we've seen in the second half of the 20th century is, an acceleration of eras. So I just did a, I'm trying to cut it down from three hours, uh, part 10 of how we got here. It's just the last five years of the 20th century. And because so much changed from the first five years of the 1990s. I mean, it's just like, it's amazing how radically different the first half and the second half of the 1990s are. And yeah. then comes planes into a couple of buildings and then everything it's like the late 1990s never happened yeah 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 and no. that's how fast it's almost like it takes about as long as a group of students to go through high school with a couple of years on either side and and now you have a new zone it's like no one can figure out where where did all the super hyper woke political correctness sjw stuff come from because it didn't seem to be there in 2010 not the way it was by 2015 right it's so, so I spent my eighties in the bubble of Calvin college and seminary for the most part, after I left New Jersey, I graduated from high school in New Jersey in 81. And so the whole eighties for me were within a particular bubble. I spent most of the nineties in the Dominican Republic. And so there were sort of two decades, you know, and, you know, part of what, part of what is you know, I'm impressed with not not in terms of in a necessarily in a positive way, is the is is how this how these visual, especially the the motion picture media reinforces and and you know not only expresses but of course um, impresses upon culture. Because, you know, of course, for me, the 90s, the 80s and 90s for me in terms of the images I see, and even though at college I was, I was, you know, listening to the music and so on and so forth, Calvin College is a different world than, mm -hmm. it's a very different world than even, you know, Patterson was very different from New York. We'd go into the city semi-often, my my father, my father would enjoy going into the city, but we'd, we'd always tend to go to certain places in the city. We certainly didn't live in the city, but we're, you know, and, and so, but when I, you know, when I look at now, when I look at, you know, even with the proliferation of, I mean, right, what's happening right now is all these streaming services. So there's Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu and and HBO and, you know, the networks are sort of being deconstructed and cable television and is sort of, you know, passing away. But yet this, this kind of eye of Sauron um, spotlight that, that takes certain images and a zeitgeist and sort of embeds them. I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and, and it's, it's difficult for me to, to understand you know, to the degree, we we all have this naive apprehension of the world. We can't help but have it, and it's our own, right. and it's it's shaped by our own consciousness. But but increasingly, there's this there's this other there's this other thing out there, which even while at the same time, it's it's sort of been spotlighting aspects of the world now, especially in the in the Trump world where everything is just being deconstructed there, you know, I, 
I can always, you know, I, I, I look at the post-election drama with Trump v. Biden as compared to Bush v. Gore. And to me, it looks like two totally different worlds. Oh, different order of experience, totally. And isn't this completely exhausting? <laughs> yes. Know, it, it's like, it, because we, we, we got to this point where we thought, okay, there's going to be some kind of revolution, resolution of some sort. Don't say, and don't then, say revolution. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> we might be joining you in Tbilisi. <laughs> a bit of a slip there. But, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's strange because, and, you know, we just, it's like, you arrive at this plateau. It reminds me of the moment in a horror film where the people enter the house and it's dark. And then people say, why don't we split up? <laughs> you know, and, and we're losing track of the plot, you know? <laughs> and the whole audience is going, no! Especially if, you, if you've ever gone to a black, a black movie theater, it's like they really love talking to the screen. It's just like, don't do it! <laughs> You know, and yet that's where we are. We're in this weird zone that's, it's like you're just sitting there going like, I don't know what's going to happen here, but it is weird. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to have any money on anything. Well, and, and, you know, you're seeing it. I mean, you're, you're, you're observing this oh, from yeah. way up in the nosebleed section. I mean, <laughs> in some oh, ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're on YouTube and you're, I mean, obviously anybody who has watched your channel can see this long-term careful reflection of, of really the making of culture, the making of culture in music, the making of culture in art, the making of culture in propaganda. I mean, when I look at your channel, that's what I see you doing. And mm -hmm. in some ways, your your seats up in the nosebleed are really helpful to the rest of us because you you see if you're courtside, you know. Oh, I know. But you're way up there, and you're like, oh, well. No, I'm actually very very grateful to be in Tbilisi because you know I don't run into every day people wanting to know which side are you on. I don't run into that that all or or the kind of people who all assume we are all doing X. We're all like that. We all hate Trump. We all love Trump. Whatever. I'm not part of that. So I can stand back. And even in Alaska, it would have affected me. Yeah. You know, uh, because you know the the little town I'm from, which unfortunately is going through a nightmarish disaster right now, is is kind of split between one side and the other as far as viewpoints go. Yeah. So it would have still been an issue, you know? And I think that being away from here, I often, you know, what's funny is I left New York City in 1996 and I'd actually written the words, I'm leaving here because I'm afraid it's ground zero for whatever's coming. Hmm. <laughs> and then it came and I wasn't surprised at all, but I was, of course, deeply saddened and, you know, paid attention to what was going on. But I, but then I said, how come I'm not there? You know, and now I've got the same feeling where it's, it's like, like I said, there's been a huge landslide and floods in my town that's kind of ruined the town and that and having no, absolutely no tourism there this year, which was the lifeblood of the summer season. And I'm sitting there going like, what am I doing here? I go like, well, whatever it is, is I, I think I should be here. Yeah. But it is interesting to look at these things from afar well, and how, to see what's happening in America. Let, let's talk, you know, maybe, maybe now we can dare talk about he who must not be named so often. Um, you know, the, and I'm going to get in trouble on both sides, but that's sort of always where care. the fun space is. I don't care. Um, the, I, that, how... You know, one of the amazing things that Trump did, and, and I saw this from, you know, my friends on the left, especially, I mean, this, this Trump derangement syndrome, he so, he so thoroughly colonized his opponents as to, you know, lather them up into, you know, 
it, it's how can we how can we account for and you know what's what's going to come next is going to be fascinating because you know he's not going away the question will be can he troll just as effectively on twitter from someplace other than the white house always of course with the with the idea of 2024 coming forward i'm working from the assumption that on inauguration day it'll be joe biden up on the stand and donald trump will be somewhere down in florida uh doing what he does um Mm -hmm. you know he won't he won't be on the stand there that that you know another piece that i think we're seeing now is the all of these rituals that many of us have grown up with that we never gave a second thought to suddenly they have they're invested in with incredible meaning that the defeated president shares the stand with the election victor and so you know the and so i'm just curious from your point of view both up there in the nosebleeds and also from your years of reflecting on the culture i mean i i think for the next few years and there's going to be all kinds of tell-all books coming out of the white house we know that people have been taking mm-hmm. copious notes in the trump administration and and they're going to cash in on those books but mm-hmm. what what brought us to what brought us to donald trump and gave him all this power well, you know, in the 1970s, I, I've told you before, I was in the Jesus people. And then it, the group I was in started to mutate and take on cult-like aspects. And they were getting this from a thing called the shepherding movement, which was a charismatic uh, movement in the 1970s that started to put all these churches in, under an umbrella. So up until the time I left to go to Labrie in 1978, I was more increasingly uh, locked away in this group. Now, I would say we were not so much uh, heretical in idea as much as we were becoming heretical in practice. So, but, so, you know, and a lot of stuff, you know, uh, what you did with your money, who you married, uh, where you lived, was all had to be kind of okayed by the people above you who then reported to more people above them who reported to more people above them and i guess the way this was supposed to work was eventually the leaders would there were like five guys out of florida and uh, the south who who were the final arbiters of everything and they uh were supposed to be responsible to each other well of course it was never that simple or that good but um but i remember how we looked at the outside world and then I went to Labrie, and at Labrie, I had myself kind of, a lot of that stuff just shook off very quickly because I, I was already seeing, and that was part of the reason I went to Labrie, that we had a real problem. And it wasn't just we, our group, but we Christians had a real problem. And that problem was we had no idea uh, what was going on in the world anymore. Then after I got back from Labrie, I spent about a year there. Uh, I went back to California, felt I really couldn't stay there and ended up moving to New York City to pursue getting the information I'm sharing with people now to start seriously doing that. So one of the things that had hit me in Labrie was that uh, I should really uh, buckle down and try to understand. Uh, I I, I felt I already had a good... uh, ability to see and comprehend things, but I felt, so when I got to New York City, after a while, I was with such a different group of people. People who looked at, like in our world, the Christian world, we would look at those kind of people and that kind of stuff as being, well, the big word, if you really wanted to tar someone with a good word was demonic. You know, those things are demonic. That that rock music is demonic. That Those films are demonic and such like that. But then I got into the other world and I looked and I saw how people were treating, how they were looking at Christians. And I saw that, oh, they've got their own words for them. 
you know, they've got, and their words are just as severe. So if you label someone as picophobic, you know, whatever it is, uh, you're just basically saying they're not human beings, you know? And, I, and so there was at the beginning of the 1980s, a film that came out uh, was the second Mad Max film. I'd seen the first one in California at a drive-in movie theater. So, but the second one looked really interesting and it, and it is a very interesting film, but there's a scene in it. Mad Max starts off in the wasteland and he comes upon this group of marauders who've encircled this uh, place that has oil ref refinery in it. And they are you know, going with these motorcycles and dune buggies and stuff and attacking him. So Mad Max is watching from an adjacent hill and he's watching them uh, going down there. Then what happens, without getting into the plot so much, is he ends up inside the compound. And suddenly there's a scene where he suddenly shifts, he's inside looking out. And he's seeing what it looks like to have all of these people coming at you and how these people are trying to defend themselves. And I've often felt like that, that sense of having seen both sides of things. You know, the uh, not that there's only two sides, but, uh, so what I see now is I see uh, the dangers on the left. And I also know it doesn't take much to kick the people on the right into high gear because, and this is one of the things I saw back in the 80s. Why are they seeing the Christians like that? Why are the Christians seeing them like that? It's because they're not looking at real people. They're looking at the propaganda version of these people and they th they're mistaking this symbolic representation, a bad use of symbols for those people themselves. And that's where we are. The, it's, you know, the lines are different, but nevertheless, it's so easy for people to go off their, uh, off their propaganda image. Every now and then I'll get someone who'll say something to me, write something to me like burn. Uh, uh, have you ever been red pill? To which I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm not six. I don't need to. I've never had the problem. You know, I, it's not a question for me. You know, it's like, you know, I've been like this since at least the time I went to Labrie in 1978. So, no, no. <laughs> and I don't care. You know, keep your pills. You know, it's just like uh, pills are for sick people or people who want to get high. And I'm neither. <laughs> so, uh, I'm fine, <laughs> but it's, but the, you know, that's like a bit of right-wing propaganda. On the left, I've got friends who will write to me on, uh, through Facebook or something. And every now and then I'll get someone who, who I can tell they're like pressing me to know what my thoughts about he who shall not be named are. To which I just simply say, well, I, you know, uh, I didn't vote for him and uh, he's not the antichrist. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so, uh, and but people get so backed into their corners that then they start acting really strange. And I think we've seen a lot of that this year, and we're going to see more of it. I don't see it slowing down anytime no, soon. No, no, we don't have. There is one good thing I see, and it relates back to the IDW concept, but I think it's broader than that. And and I and. If, if you start looking at where we are now, there are certain things which are interesting in a good way. One is, uh, well, what's the orthodoxy thing going on? Yes, yeah, I wanna to talk to you about that too. Yeah, that's really fascinating because, and, and it's not just happening in one little place here or there, you know? Next, um, how can you get someone like Douglas Murray talking to Christians and Douglas Murray is totally gay and the Christians are totally not and they're having a good conversation. I almost have this kind of, well, in my more pixelated fantasy moments, I say like, man, if we could just get rid of all these people who are howling about all this, you know, uh, the, the wanting the perfect utopian world, if we could just if somehow they would just all stop talking, which they're not going to, but if they could, then we could get back to the 90s. And I think we've got enough people over here to try to resolve some of the issues from the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we've got, we've got uh, you know, 
skate punks like Tim Poole and we've got people like Joe Rogan who's like I mean I remember listening to an early Joe Rogan comedy record and I've got I've got a CD of his and it's just like oh man this guy's kind of off the hook um but you know you've got you know Ben Shapiro over here you've got all these people who've been suddenly pushed off into this corner it's a big corner yeah and they're having really interesting conversations yeah. with each other yeah you know i mean i'm seeing you know lesbians having conversations with christians and you can tell every now and then they'll get back to i almost think like okay well if you got rid of all this other stuff these people go back to fighting and but but nevertheless they're having interesting conversations in a way they should have been having in the 1990s hmm. but they didn't because the culture war had already started and at that time the line was drawn a certain way and that line is no longer drawn the same way what's happened is the people on the left fringe have redrawn the line so far over with the new concepts of yeah. gender and and whatever race is defined as now and oppression that they've kicked out so yeah. many people yeah. from you know it's like if you're center moderate left you're you're now considered pretty much i mean they're going to target you with the word far right yeah yeah well that that's that's me <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get on this. I didn't get on this uh, list of this. I don't know if you saw Rebel Wisdom. David Fuller just put a little video complaining how he was, you know, he was tarred on this. Somebody did this study, and of course, and you know, Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro, Rebel Wisdom, Jordan Peterson, you know. But of course, we we strange Christians. I, I don't know quite if they know what to do if we're not, you know, if we're not Dennis Prager or John MacArthur or um, Southern Baptist, I don't know if they quite know what to do with us because we're not making the kind of noises they expect us to make. But I do want to get exactly. to this orthodoxy thing because of course with my, with, you know, so we have, this discord server and this discord server has become one of the centers of the community of people that have been paying attention to my videos and of course orthodoxy is the new hotness and i i really there, there's always a whenever you know especially if you're of a certain age and you have found the answer and mm -hmm. you are have the opportunity to pursue the answer in some much more real way rather than just consuming YouTube videos. If you can actually, you know, find a church and participate in it. And, and, and there's always this, this, this wistful idea that if only we were bigger, if only there were more of us, if only we had a bigger slice of the pie, then and it's so interesting to me because you're living in one of the most orthodox places in the world right now, um, yes, you know, know, where we started. And and I, I so wonder if I were to, you know, because I've had the, as have you, the, the experience of leaving your, and I think you, like me, also grew up in places where there are lots of cultural folds. So right from the start, you begin mm -hmm. to notice that it's the folds that are the really interesting places. And mm -hmm. so when you, let's say if we were to take all a bunch of people from the Discord server and send them all off to live with you in Georgia, not Georgia, the American state, but the Georgia, the <laughs> the, the state funny. on the yes. other side of the world and and say okay go to church here of course for the first few months it would be wow you know the the icons and the buildings and the liturgy but three to six to eight months after that i wonder what their impressions would be because of course orthodoxy in america even though they've got the robes and the beards and the icons Mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. by virtue of the context that's a whole different thing than oh, yeah. orthodoxy and tbilisi yeah it's the difference between being in a catholic church in like san mateo uh, county you know and a catholic church in rome you know it's like <laughs> it's going to be a little different and um yeah uh you know people have said well Bern, are you going to become orthodox to which my answer is i'm weighing things 
and I'm weighing things very well because I do, there are issues that I have and, uh, and I haven't found a resolution to them. Now, one of the big problems here is just simply the language. And, uh, but I do go to the church. I consider, obviously consider them Christians and such. And, and the, the big question is, do they consider me a Christian? <laughs> and that is actually one of my, uh, my bigger uh, holdups is that there is a sense within the Orthodox tradition of basically considering only the Orthodox to be the true Christians. And it can sometimes get that one country's Orthodox doesn't really consider the other country's Orthodox to be quite Orthodox enough. They do have their problems. Another problem is they're getting mixed up with the state. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot of history of that. Um, and like I say, I feel like I'm in Christendom. I've gone back to Christendom here. I mean, sometimes I meet people here whom I love who talk in a way that I think most Americans would find almost bizarre because, I mean, as much as they, you know, they go on uh, Jonathan Peugeot's symbolic journey and they get an awful lot of good sustenance out of that, the people, I meet people here whose viewpoint is not too different from the viewpoint they would have held in the Middle Ages. And I mean that very precisely. That is to say, they will look at the world. I mean, through their eyes, even if they're living. I mean, I, I have a very good friend who, I mean, she's really intelligent and uh, you know lives in the modern world. But when you start talking, her talking about the faith, it's like a whole different order of experience. I find it really fascinating. But I, at the same time, you know, now to to put some of my cards on the table one of my biggest influences if someone was to say where are the golden ages of christianity where are some of the places you would really love to be to see the christianity well one of the places would be about i don't know fourth or fifth century ireland but the next spot on the map uh, probably be 17th century holland <laughs> you know the netherlands at that point was just really fascinating um, not that I consider it, I know it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, the, the Dutch were allowing a variety of religions. They were allowing Descartes to be printed there when he couldn't be printed in France. They also were supreme artists. Um, and they made pretty good music. I mean, it wasn't quite on the Bach level, but a lot of them from the Renaissance and such influenced Bach. And so, you know, and I just look at that and go like, wow, what a very fascinating time. Um, and for instance, the Kuyperian movement and stuff like that, that also in fact affected me. And it came through, a lot of this has come through Rookmacher. Right. And then I would meet other Dutch. And then I, I, so I found the Dutch tradition very interesting. So I've got enough of that kind of thing. Then again, I've read, I've got one new Solzhenitsyn book that came out literally about a week ago. And it's his, his second half of his memoirs in, um, in America. And uh, I've read pretty much everything by Solzhenitsyn. I'm reading right now, I'm reading Dostoevsky's uh, Demons, or it's sometimes called The Possessed. And that's the first time I've read that. When I read that, that would pretty much be all of the Dostoevsky. You know, Tarkovsky is one of my favorite directors. And I really get the orthodox connection of to why they can do what they can do. So there's a lot to weigh and measure here. You know, um, it's like... Uh, but it's it's fascinating to see. I think part of the problems of having a a culture which is a certain kind of Christian is, like I say, you can get a lot of people who are nominal. A lot of people who, you know, they would if, if pushed, they would immediately say, "I'm a Christian." But you know, you, you never see any real signs of it. But at the same time, it's fascinating because, like I say, and and in a way, I think which would have been somewhat medieval everything is under the umbrella and I feel as a visitor and a you know living from another country here under the umbrella and I feel perfectly fine there you know so um now if if there was some sort of major political thing and some sort of uh, nationalist movement that wanted some sort of purification I might be in a different sort of zone but then again I've had enough 
contacts with Georgians here to have a good idea. I mean, I had one of the best visits of my life out to this uh, cave city called Vardzia. And it's, uh, it was made as a cave city to protect uh, the people from the Turks and the Mongols and such, and the Persians. And uh, then it ended up becoming a monastery, uh, just an amazing place. But what my, my time there this year, I went out there for several days and um, nice drive out there. And, and I met this family who just fed me. Uh, I was staying in their guest house, but their guest house wasn't the same place as their house. And in fact, they just said, well, you can just walk up the hill to find my house. And had I done that at night, I don't know what country I would have ended up in. They're not too far from the Turkish border. You know, I mean, it's literally, I could have easily gotten lost and found uh, menacingly by some Caucasian shepherd dog. And um, they're pretty frightening out there. But these people would give me food. They would sing at night. Uh, they, they, you, but what's funny is I was the only visitor they had at their guest house all year. Wow. These people had no money. They were, they were, the woman was pretty intelligent. She was like a teacher and such, uh, but they had, uh, you know, no money coming in really to speak of. But when I was there, I went around their house and it was just completely, the garden was totally full. It's like, there's all the tomatoes and there's all the peppers and there's all the corn and there's all the beans and there's all, and then you look at the trees and every tree was like, there's a quince tree and there's a wall. that level and uh and um i also have friends okay are you having problems with i, I just had an interruption but you're back okay because if if you lose me then it's uh from uh, you know, put me on pause and i'll come back in five minutes because i have a weird internet connection here. okay so, <laughs> but anyway uh no i find that the georgian uh the Georgian mentality is interesting. You know, a lot of countries are xenophobic. Georgians are more like xenophilic. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. They really like outsiders. Yeah. Part is they've been attacked by them so often, but rather than become hostile toward them, they believe that the visitor is a guest from God. The Poles have a very similar philosophy. Hmm. And hmm. Uh, being part Polish, I really like Poland as well. Hmm. But uh, but no, I, I I really appreciate the Orthodox society. And like I say, I'm weighing seriously. At some point here, I need to find a, a priest or a monk or somebody who uh, who knows English well enough to have a good discussion vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Georgian Orthodoxy. So, yeah. but like I say, I'm not I'm not jumping to do that. But I do go to the Orthodox churches every now and then and yeah. partake. Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, Tom Holland's work, you sort of see Christianity from below. It's, 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 it's below the perceptual radar for a lot of the people in the culture. It's the, um, it's the, the moral values that they inherited naively. And I don't mean that pejoratively, but they simply unreflectively, it's, it's simply the way it is. But the, when, when the church comes when the church comes from above, it's, it's really hard for the church to, well, let me say it this way. It's, it's always difficult for the religious to deal with the nominal and, mm -hmm. and the, and the, um, the ongoing reality of nominality. I'll say it that way, that okay. even in a, even in a, a deeply, um, even in a deeply Christian country like Georgia, or even let's say, you know, some town in the Bible Belt in the United States where high percentages of people attend church, you've still got your, um, you've, you've still got your people who aren't going to go to church. They're your outliers. They're, you know, they're the people who are low in agreeableness. They're, you know, they're, they're all, and, and they don't go away. And this is part of the thing that I've appreciated about Jonathan Peugeot's uh, continued to continued reminder to um, don't, you know, don't try to dispel the fringes, leave, leave the fringes be, don't cultivate, don't harvest the field all the way to the edges, leave the corners of the field. 
um, you know, and the wisdom, the wisdom in that, and you see that, you know, that there's, there's an, it's, it's very difficult to call Jesus in the gospels tyrannical. And then mm-hmm. it's one of the interesting aspects of him. And, and so in, in deeply devout, energetic Christian communities to, to also, and I think this is one of the things that I, you know, I really inherited from my father and it probably comes from the Dutch and, you know, knowing now a little bit more of my own family history probably comes from the experience of, of Jewishness amongst the Dutch to an appreciation for, for tolerance. And um, even, even with a, a vivid, even with a vivid embrace of the sovereignty of God that affords a certain degree of, well, let's not have too heavy of a touch with those who are uh, heretical or non-compliant or heterodox in one way or another. Can we make space for them in our community? And what does that, what does the community then look like? And, and I think about that, you know, with the stories I just told of, you know, going to church with, recovering heroin addicts Mm -hmm. um you you what what does it you know what does it mean for and especially recovering heroin addicts in the first ward of patterson which is a little which is a ghetto in the midst of a an extraordinarily ethnically and culturally diverse area of the country um right so it's you know and it's we, we begin, we begin to see, and, you know, actually I appreciate having heard Jordan Peterson's little introduction to his book. I, I'm glad that he is going to address order this time because one of, one of the things we do see is this, this rise of the demand of a certain form of righteousness that, um, you know, here is, here is the righteousness that you must, that you must comply with. And, uh, yeah, it's not gonna. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. There's a certain element of, of people that makes, um, that that leaves the edges, uncultivated. Well, you know, as we look back in history, the uh, 18th century was a very strange and kind of loose epoch which then led into the 19th century, which was the tightest, most buttoned down period imaginable, which then led to the 20th century, which by the end of it is just completely off the hook, which means we're due for the, that swing back towards conservative, I, I don't wanna say conservatism because that sounds like a political thing, but it, it goes has to go back towards uh, redressing so many of the problems. We can already see it even among the people who have nothing to do with Christianity. So many of the people, which is why what's interesting is what's happening is the libertarians on the left and uh, you know, you're know you finding them moving toward, over towards the conservative camp. Although the other people have moved even more conservative. There, there, there is a new kind of puritanism on the left, uh, puritanism that goes not it, it it you know I'm sure it has to do with what you eat, I'm sure it has to do with your health, but I'm also sure it has to do with what you say and speak, and what you think, and how what you say reflects what you might be thinking. You know that that this you know so it's all about the words you use and how that reflects who you are. So if that's on one side, but the other side, what's weird is then what would have been conservative in the 20th century is now taking on a very different cast. And what's interesting is that the people over here who have been thinking that they are the the bulwark of compassion and of, of liberal values in the some sort of traditional sense of, of looking out for the oppressed, have no idea, literally, what's going on over here. They have no idea that there are all these people, you know, that are of many different strains. Uh, some of them appear to be getting along famously 
what's going on? You see, I mean, it's not all that. You still got some, you know, you've got your hardcore uh, backwoods Christians who are like, you know, that Jordan Peterson, that guy, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, you got those people. He's like, it's not really biblical Christianity to which the answer to that is, well, I'm not expecting him to be a biblical Christian, but isn't it interesting? We can talk to him, <laughs> you know, um, and there is, that is one of the things that gives me hope, maybe a radical center. You know, something in the center which allows for more people under the tent. Yeah. That to me shows the most hope for going forward. Yeah. Because there are further down the right wing line, yeah. some other people who certainly aren't like that. Yeah. And there are yeah. certainly people in the left wing line, quite a few of them, as it turns out, who certainly don't want to take part in this conversation. But the more they squeeze for this new uh, woke puritanism, yeah. the more people are going to drift over here yeah. into yeah. this radical center. Yeah. To me, that's the hope of, of at least Western society. Yeah. Because within that, what I see, like when I do my stuff, I mean, I'm always valuing reading reading good stuff reading old stuff reading tough stuff i'm always valuing knowing your history knowing your time finding yourself in time i'm always valuing uh you know yes symbols and learn to to observe them but also learn to uh, when they're being used against you yeah yeah you know yeah. and but and and what i'm finding is that there are people who, it's like you're pouring water on plants that haven't had it for years. There's so many, and I'm sure you've discovered that quite a few yeah. times yourself. And I'm sure that's what Peterson tapped into. Yeah. I'm sure that's what Peugeot, Peugeot is tapping into, yeah. or Tom Holland, yeah. or Verveke, yeah. or any of these people. Yeah. Well, you and know, it's it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a diverse bunch of them too. I mean, again, Peterson, this this oh, yeah. rough man from the northern west, who you know. And of course, for Peterson and Verveke is, you know, plenty of difference between those two. Peugeot, again, it's the these recent conversations between Peugeot and, um, you know, the this, this rationality bunker, rules. Rationality and, rules. It's like, yeah, yeah, that was very fascinating. Wow, wow. And uh, I mean, I, I've long told people, I says you, you have to understand just how conservative jonathan peugeot is in certain respects yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. this is this is ancient stuff he's you know ladling right. out and y'all are are filling your bowls with it and asking for more and so you know it's not a surprise that i i'm curious from your perspective i don't know how how much you can see of it but what do you see is going on in europe right now well france had this whole thing the uh gilets jaunes which is the yellow vests right now this was a huge thing which also got finally basically stopped put on pause we'll say by the virus um what's fascinating though is that it was of no particular stripe in the beginning it was just like common working people who were saying we got to do something because we're being taxed to death that kind of thing and uh but then uh, the left came together with them on that. Now, what's weird about the left in France is you do have some more, I mean, uh, you know, what they say in America, uh, in Europe is that, you know, the left in America are conservatives. <laughs> and I talked to uh, one of my friends in Paris is actually a Marxist. I mean, you know, we're not talking a real Marxist. Post neo whatever we're talking marxist although he has a lot of uh, environmental thought with him as well and he can't stand the new woke gender stuff so he and i have great conversations <laughs> and that's what's really funny and i get the feeling there's more of that bubbling under the surface there there's a similar thing i think happening in in london but you know what's happening is right now we've got this weird pressure cooker of the lockdowns and stuff and europe has just been i mean prague prague i mean czech people do not get up in arms hardly ever 
And there was like a, a huge demonstration in the center of Prague uh, with people getting arrested and tear gas and such over lockdowns. Hmm. You know, this was about a month ago. Uh, we're seeing these kinds of protests all over. And I think that that says something. What it says is hard to say. Because uh, is it like America coming from more conservative right-wing people? In a way, yes, but in a way it's just people who, it's kind of like, look, not that many people are dying. Come on, let us go, you know? And of course they've all gone through their second lockdown phase. They're all in and out. We are here. Like I said, we about a little less than a month ago, we went into it. And they waited for the elections here. They had a presidential a major election for parties here. And they waited for that to pass, which was probably a smart thing because there was a lot of heat around that. And it was like literally two days before ours in America. So they waited for that to pass. And then I said, I, you know, everybody knew they were going to do it afterwards. So the ruling party stayed in power. And then, you know, like I say, now masks everywhere, uh, curfews nine till five in the morning, uh, all of this stuff. But Georgians, like I've said before, they know the meaning of the word bad. <laughs> so to them, it's kind of like they, they get resigned. You know, they've they've seen a civil war within the lifetime of anyone uh, 30 years or older here. You know, they know that it can be tough. Even the people who are 20 years old here have seen tough stuff. So they know bad and they don't want bad again. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're willing to, you know, kind of go through it. And uh, the government is basically locked down the whole Christmas New Year's season here, which lasts until Orthodox New Year's, which is uh uh, what the, it's like well, the seventh, so it'd be the fourteenth of January. The seventh is Christmas here of January. So it's it's uh, yeah. At the same time, it feels weirder because it's not quite as locked down as it was earlier. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, I did a video on my Georgian Crossroads channel not too long ago about just as we started going into this new phase about all businesses that shut down in Georgia. And I think it's gonna be even more with this. It's like basically two months of lockdown. It's supposed to be January 31st. So, wow. you know. What's the, what's the feeling there about vaccines? That's really good. I've got a friend coming over later this week who'll probably, he's, he's a, about 25, he's in university and he usually has a very good uh, political radar. He's studying politics and stuff. So he usually has good radar for uh, what's going on. And uh, he's also not a Christian and he, he wants the church to be much more separate from uh, the state. Uh, and he says, there's a, there's a certain grouping of students who are more Western leaning who all kind of feel that way. So I think eventually there's going to be some issues along those lines, maybe, you know, 10 years or so when they get to closer. I mean, Georgia tends to respect older people. You know, if I go into a subway, just because I've got gray hair, people will say, do you want to sit? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to know. They're like, no, no, let me alone. I'm what, fine. What's your, what's your take on, on Western influence in Georgia? Well, there's Western influence and then there's technological influence. Western influence would be in terms of ideas. So, you know, there are people here who see things like the transgender movement. They see the, you know, uh, Georgia being a Orthodox society, you know, homosexuality is not part of their vision at all. And so you, you have people here who are, I would put them, I'd say their ideas are kind of like people's in, a, in the U.S. in the 70s. You know, it's kind of more libertarian leftist idea about, you know, people should be free to do whatever. And it's not that restrictive here. It is restrictive, but not that restrictive. And then, like, I bring my friend over here and I start to show him what's going on in America. And I tell him, you're looking at one side of the hill. Let me come over here. Let me show you the other side of the hill, what it's like when you cross over here and you finally get here. And I show him the insanity 
of just news feeds and stuff of, of raw footage of what's going on in places like Portland or, you know, uh, show him what's going on in terms of, you know, some, someone says that women are biological women and get evicted from Twitter, <laughs> you know, and he just goes like, oh, that's too much. <laughs> and, and I think I haven't met a Georgian who wouldn't say something like they're very, maybe one or two that might be like that, but most of them are, are like, oh, that's not what we were hoping for. Hmm. So hmm. that's Western influence. Technological influence is a very different beast. And that is, you know, computers, smartphones, things like that. The smartphone here is, well, it's doing what it's doing everywhere. Yeah. It's cutting out the culture as people have direct access to all this other crap online. So that I have a friend here who he's, uh, he's actually uh, part English, part uh, Austrian, but grew up in Brussels. So, you know, he's trilingual and all this other stuff. And he's married to a Georgian woman. And he says, you know, 10 years ago, you'd go into a restaurant and you see a group of Georgian men singing together. It would be a regular sight. You wouldn't think anything of it. Now you rarely see that as much as you did because everyone's got their phone and default position for everyone is just like, you know, just look down at your hand and, and you go into the subway and you see that and such. So, and, and then bringing in things like big malls and such here, uh, fast food and which I, that's Western influence, but I tend to look at it more as technological because the nature of those things. So um, what's, what is interesting though, is while for instance, I can see the latest Marvel or Star Wars movie here, there are no geeks here. And by geeks, I mean the people whose lives are lived for all the little nerdy parts of the franchise, whatever it is, or the video game series, whatever. They're all franchises, really. So that that I have not seen anybody here among the, 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 the younger people or whatever whose lives revolve around the Star Wars universe, the MCU, the DCU. Even Tolkien people, you, you know, there are people here, they go and they say, oh, I like that movie. It's the way I used to go see it in, you know, 1970s when I first saw Star Wars. I came out of it and I'm like, yeah, it was pretty fun. Uh, it wasn't that good, but it was fun. That's how I thought of it. Yeah. But later you'd find people who live in these worlds. There aren't those people here, which I find refreshing because they, the one thing they haven't gotten, even though, you know, there, it's knocking on the door, is the postmodern cultural perspective. And I don't mean so much the postmodern philosophy as I mean that the ironic culture of which to me, all the, all the, uh, the cargo cult of geekiness, uh, uh, various uh, things that people will invest their whole lives in like a religious experience doesn't exist here. And so basically what you have is you have like, for instance, I've never been in a place where I meet uh, young college students and you start talking with them. I mean, some are 20 years old, you know, you start talking with them and you start saying, well, what's your favorite movie? And they'll start going, Tarkovsky's Stalker. And I'm sitting there going like, and, and I've talked to people, Americans who are cynically like, well, you know, it's Russia, they're in the Russian influence. I said, no, you don't understand. They hate Russia. <laughs> <laughs> they appreciate art is what it is they've yeah. they've got a sense of that they're willing to sit through and read long things and and you know and they're reading it when they're when they know english and stuff they're reading in english is quite good yeah. you know and so it's it's a whole different attitude like i say last time i really came across this attitude was sometime in the early 80s in america where there were still people who were really interested in books and really interested in such what they don't have though and this has been taken out by uh, the, the problems they went through in the 90s is they have no culture. They do have some bookstores here, but they don't have a great culture of bookstores at all. I mean, the Czech Republic, on the other hand, if you go to Prague, it's amazing how many really good bookstores there are in Prague, far more than many other cities its size. You know, it's just, I mean, you just go on certain streets and it's just like endless, you know, because uh, the Czechs really like to read too. But, uh, but they don't have, for instance, uh, my friend who comes over now and then and we discuss things, um, 
uh, he he was saying to you know what it is is they've gotten into this culture of streaming and downloading whatever they need and they know how to get around all the corners it's almost like we're on the outside of that world so a lot of the laws that apply to most people don't apply here and no, no one cares and, and that, so that's kind of the same are, in the dominican republic i mean there's yeah proxy yeah. servers so dealing and, with poor people yeah. that's like but but and so my friends you know he has all these books on uh, whatever reading app he's got or whatever and then the other day he was telling me yeah i just bought this book and i said you buying books because he knows I buy books. He goes like, yeah, I saw that you have books because I've been buying books, have, having them sent to me here. And I said, oh, good for you. Because because to me, it's different when the book is in your hand and you paid for it and now you've got to read it. You know, it's like, this is work. I mean, to me, there's different degrees of getting something. And one of those degrees is, okay, I've gone through the trouble of searching for it. Here's the physical copy. Now that commits me to trying to get through it. Yeah. You know? Do you think these technological changes are going to, I mean, to what degree are they going to destroy this culture? I mean, because that's- That's a good question. And they haven't lost all their music yet. They haven't lost their their dance yet. But one big thing here is uh, the kind of EDM, electronic dance music scene, uh, raves, techno, stuff like that. So much so that last year, like I said, there was like huge loudspeakers and people, uh, they had like a whole like circus tent set up for people on the streets as part of the Christmas celebration, which just made me go, ah, <laughs> you know, there are things like that that drive me nuts, uh, as as there are anywhere, you know, there's always something that drives you nuts. But uh, at the same time, I haven't noticed that the people who, for instance, many more Georgians seem to like jazz than Americans per capita. Huh. Many more Georgians like classical music and pay attention to it than Americans do, certainly by far. We, uh, most Georgian students here are gonna know the, some folk music much more so than any American student of a similar age would. You know, They're going to have more connections that way. The part of the problem is, is they got so poor. They used to be a well-off place in the Soviet Union. And then during their civil war in the 1990s, I mean, they were without electricity for you know, weeks and months here. I mean, but here's the weird thing. As poor as Georgians are, and right now, my dollar is like almighty. I mean, when I first uh, came here in 2016, it was $1 to 2.35 lari. Uh, so two, two lari to, and 35 tetri, they're, they're cents. Now it's 3.30. You know, so I'm just like, you know, and I, I don't get that much money for my uh, part of the reason I started getting my retirement a bit early was because I knew that I could stretch right here, you know, right. and I kind of run out of my uh, uh, the, the job prospects that I had, but I felt I should be here. And I, I, that's also when I started doing the YouTube channel, because I said, yeah, it's a good time to start doing something like this. Let's yeah, try. Well, I, I think it's but, a, uh, I think it's what you owe the world at this stage in your life. I mean, well, you've yeah, been absorbing and accumulating and archiving, and now it's time for you to share yeah. what you've learned. And I feel that. I feel that as a responsibility because it's like, yeah, I've got this huge library I'm trying to get from Alaska to here and um, not able to do it this year. Uh, but, you know, it's like I've got half my money saved up to get it. Uh, I, I got enough to get it here. But my problem is I don't have a place to put it in. That is to say, this place I don't feel I should be call a permanent home. So I have to buy a home, which isn't much. It's like if I get five to ten thousand dollars, I can put that down and pay three hundred or four hundred dollars a month rent and pay it off in ten years or less. <laughs> so it isn't like a difficult thing. It's just yeah. I have to raise a bit more money by say when my storage unit cost for next year is up, which would be. Uh, October. We'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, so I have all this junk and it really is, it's both a blessing and a curse. It's a, it's a curse to move it, but it's a blessing because I've been able to, like one of the reasons I went to Alaska from New York is because I said, I want to be in some place where I'm just not another silly collector, where I'm a resource for people. 
And indeed, that's what I was in the little town of Haines. I was a resource for people with my music library, uh, my, my book library, my movie library, and I used all of them quite well. Um, so here, I feel the same way. It's like so much of my music collection is exactly the stuff they missed during the, the heart of the uh, Soviet system, hmm. you know, because they were in for the 70 year run mostly, you know? So uh, I have essentially what was missing and it's just like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it all when I die, but I think this is a good place for it to be. Oh well, yeah, because so, then it can it can start to not I that mean, I'm you planning can... on dying right away, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> well, none of us. <laughs> so, well, so sometimes it sometimes it catches us by surprise, and sometimes we see it well, coming. Exactly, so right. um, yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's you're you're absolutely right. So I you know, I was listening to Simon Shama, the historian, talking the other day. He wrote a really great book about. The golden age of the Netherlands, by the way, called uh, "Embarrassment of Riches," but uh, he said the other day he's getting—he's probably in his seventies. And someone said, "Well, are you reading more?" Uh, and he said, "I am reading all the time. I'm trying to get as much done as possible before I die." And that's kind of how I feel. Yeah. I mean, I'm reading much more, and I'm, of course, doing all this stuff. I've spent way too long making the next uh, how we got here but fortunately i think there's only two or three more to go and i'm done at least for a while and then i can concentrate on things that aren't quite so they've just they've gotten longer and longer it's a good thing i didn't start off <laughs> i noticed that because the first one it's like because i thought oh i gotta catch up on burn stuff so i listened to the first thought this is short then the next one that's a little longer and it's like well, it's that's well that's... i took more than a year off between i think five and six and in that time, I had uh, been putting out other videos and I'd learned how to use a lot of uh, uh, samples from things and get away with it. Not that, I mean, I'll never make any money on that stuff because it'll all be uh, right. copyright claimed by someone. But I figure right. like you guys can all deal with it. I mean, right now I'm not getting enough views on that stuff to worry about. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's fine. And in a way, you know, it's like, I'm sitting there going like, yeah, I could get more people on my channel, but you know, what's interesting. It's like, I feel like I'm in the underground and I'm building this thing up and eventually people, what happens, and this seems to happen all the time. Uh, I think I'm up to what, almost six, 700 people or so. Yeah. But someone, uh, this happens all the time where a person will find my channel and then you can tell that they're going through the whole, as yeah. much as possible, Yeah, which yeah. is like, that's what I, that's precisely why it is what it is. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. kind of, cause it's like, I want, when you get there to realize, oh my goodness, there's a lot more here that looks just as interesting as whatever it is I listen to. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There's, there's something, there's something really special about a small community where, you can you can you know you can recognize names you can recognize faces you can mm -hmm. you can begin conversations that can travel you know and it and there's and there's something you know someone who would say look at my channel i mean you the the people who found me early on um i mean they're like you and a whole whole group of other regular appears on my channel i mean it's right. it's you find you know other other people come later and that's okay too well i really appreciated uh your uh, second and first conversations with poe i i think those are really fascinating yeah because uh, she's got such a different perspective yeah you know she's yeah. very intelligent at the same yeah. time it's kind of like you can hear her like you know she's has she has to look and start turning things over and and yeah. if you know yeah. someone throws something at her she'll take it very seriously yeah. something that you or i might go like well, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> she's such an engineer. So one of my sons is an engineer and he, he's not, he's not as in much of an engineer as she is in terms of that. If you, if you get to know a bunch of engineers, you begin to notice these, you know, these traits. aspects and traits, but no, it's, it's delightful. And my mother, I told my mother, cause I haven't had a lot of conversations lately. My mother only watches the conversations. And I said, right. don't worry, mom, we got more conversations coming up. Oh, good. Cause I just talked her into, um, I yeah. just talked her into YouTube premium because, you know, I said, mom, you got to get rid of my, my, my 
now both myself and my sister, I don't know if you've seen my sister's I've, channel, her channel's totally different from mine. Oh, I've never seen an ad on your channel. You know why? I've had an ad block for ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> other way around. But, yeah. um, you know, my mother only watches the conversations and so she'll kind of look and who's there and are they interesting? And and it's it's so fascinating to me because... Google, of course, serves up all these analytics. And if you deep dive into those analytics, you can tell, you know, what people are watching and you can sort of see the points that they get interested in. But this, there are some real defects with this attention economy. And, mm -hmm. um, and I, I really hope that, I really hope that these technological waves don't rob us of too much of what's precious. Um, you know, well, it's too much of our lives. Jacques Ellul, at the end of his uh, third book on technology, uh, The Technological Bluff, which is, uh, I would suggest that is a good place to start with his technology books. But um, he says at the very end, he says, you know, are we trapped by technology? And he goes, if we think we can master it, yes, we are, because we're fools. But he says, as a system, there is no system that does not reveal cracks eventually. And we see cracks. And he says that we have to use those cracks and exploit those cracks while they remain open. Right now, YouTube is an open crack. In five years, who knows? Yeah, yeah. And, and I rejoice in that fact, uh, but you know, like I, I, I think I wrote this on uh, one of your, the comments uh, to one of your videos. I said, you know, Paul, you got in under the, uh, the wire as far as the uh, algorithms go yeah. because they totally changed it uh, in like uh, 2019. And what they did was they made it so, you know, you were getting every recommendation for Jordan Peterson and Christianity. They would all find you easily. Whereas uh, for other people just starting out now, the algorithms are not very friendly at all because they're, they're serving you up uh, stuff that is, um, well, that they think you would like, whoever they is or it is. And so it's, uh, you know, and who knows what it'll be like in four or five years. Yeah, yeah. It could stay open. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. Or it could turn into uh, a version of Netflix. Yeah. No, I, I just, you know, Providence or however you want to articulate the, you know, the, the fact that I had no idea what I was doing. I had exactly right. the right video at the right time at the right place. And, you know, the channel. Well, the way off. I look at it is like Jordan Peterson crawled under the barbed wire and held it open a little longer. And <laughs> You crawled in after him. <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> no, there's a great uh, Rookmacher quote that I finally found. Uh, I found it online, uh, the, the actual lecture that it comes from. And he says, uh, well, there are a couple of different possibilities. And he's talking about in the naturalistic scheme of things. He says, well, one possibility is that the left-wing revolution will eventually succeed. And I hope to see you, if we'll all be put in concentration camps, I hope to see you there. <laughs> then he says, the other possibility is that the right-wing counter-revolution succeeds, and uh, they'll be friendlier to Christianity on the surface, but eventually they'll put us into concentration camps. And he goes, again, I hope to see you there. <laughs> <laughs> And that's my it's like perfect you know it's just like yeah. and and he actually did time in a prisoner of war camp in uh in the netherlands in world war ii so he knows what he's talking about he's i talking think he met doiveard there but uh wow just to get up here. interesting <laughs> interesting yeah. well maybe that's a good good place to land the plane here unless you have anything Probably. else you wanted to go into no i've got the i just wanted to run through the alternative 2020 for you there and that was the only thing that I had specifically that I thought would be interesting for near the end of the year. Oh. But uh, I no, hope I'm, I've enjoyed it again. And uh, uh, yeah, save this for a little later. What do you mean? Don't post this right away? Yeah, put it closer to the end of the year. Okay. All right. I mean, not too, you know, you don't have to wait till the very end, but you know, but you, or you do what you want. It's your channel. Okay. <laughs>
So I don't know. I always, I always, I always love talking to you, Bern. I, I learned so much. I appreciate your, um, your manner, your, um, I just, I just, uh, I, I just, I just really love what you're doing and I love you. where you're doing it. And I love that you're doing it, you know, away. And, um, even though I would love to see your, for your sake, I'd love to see your channel explode and way more people listen to you. But another part of me doesn't want to see that happen because then, you know, then well, suddenly, exactly. you know, oh, I got to yeah. find a way to talk to burn and he's got well, hundred people that I, want to talk to him. And, you know, I did an interview. Do you know who David Hoffman is? He, he has a YouTube channel and he's been a, documentary filmmaker and videographer for years and years since the 60s oh yeah and i saw the guy his channel about, the other way the other day yeah interesting and, channel and, and he did an interview with me oh really and he's waiting to edit it i i don't know if the quality was very good on my end but he was waiting to edit it he wrote me uh, recently saying you know i've got someone working on it don't worry it'll it'll come and i'm going fine but he's got a pretty big channel yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know, but I'm sitting there going like, okay, when that comes, whatever, you know. Uh, I don't know if a lot of the people who are going to his channel will find it interesting, but uh, he was asking me, what was it like? Do you, you know, he says he gets a lot of younger people who want to go back to the 1950s. So he was asking me, do you think that's a good idea? To which I said, no, of course not. <laughs> there's no going back to anything. No, no, you know, there isn't. The world is like tire shredders going into a bank. You know, it's kind of like you can only go one way. Yeah. Yeah. You try to go the other way, you get your tire shredded. Yep. 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 So. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I just found his, like the, the, the algorithm served his channel up to me the other night and it was like, oh, this is interesting. I started watching. Oh, it's it. really interesting. It is. Yeah. He's got so much. Now, I actually got in trouble with him for using one of his clips without telling him. And so he charged me like $300 for it. That's how we became friends. <laughs> but I, I purposely didn't react too much. He was originally wanting 600 because that's how much he charges for using uh, his clips. And I said, well, that's like really rich for my bloodstream. But he found it because I had recommended him go to my channel and watch my How We Got Here series because it, it overlaps with a lot of his... Uh, <clears throat> uh extracts of from the 60s and 50s and all these other time periods and he was super impressed with what i was doing so it, i <laughs> i i really i really like his channel and glad thanks for the warning so but but youtube has now made it i don't know because i just recently monetized because i heard that youtube was going to be putting ads on things anyway and it's like if you're going to be putting ads on things then you know anyway so i just right. recently I monetized you explained it and, okay. and, and, but then I noticed, I didn't know if it was not available to me before, cause I didn't monetize, but now it'll show me all of the videos on YouTube that are using my stuff from my channel. That's really, oh, really? easy to find right now. Well, that's interesting. And so, you know, so you couldn't see that before. I didn't notice it before. I don't know if it was available before. I, I know that YouTube is trying to cut down, you know, if you talk to Adam Friended. Um, you know, cause he really got, he really ran his channels up pretty large, just Jordan Peterson clips. A lot of people were doing Jordan Peterson right, right. clips. They'd monetize it because Peterson wasn't monetized and YouTube is, is really clamping down on that, which, you know, okay. They want original content. I get that. But I also see well, that was the, part of their big change. Yeah. I also see the value though of, you know, I want to be able to comment. I mean, that's fair use. It's, it's you know, it's, yeah. of, it's the way well, culture so is So what made. I do is. I go through and like when I put this next thing in, they'll literally block me for two days. Really? Yeah, because I use so many clips. And I just don't care anymore because it's like, I'm not going to make any money on this. So I'll wait the two days and then it's open and I've got and I'll, I'll dispute everything and then it comes back. But I still got like 10 that won't release it. So it's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I, I, I care more about sharing the ideas than I do about making money on. Yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, and, and if I did make money on it, it wouldn't be until I get over the thousand. The one nice thing is, is my channel has a lot of hours views. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. 
you, you tell that to those people with 10 minute clips. That's right. So <laughs> once you, once you get up over a thousand subs, then you can, uh, then you can monetize. And, uh, but like you yeah, said, you most of your videos, they're not going to give you anything for them. Well, that's the thing. So anyway, well, burn again. Okay. Um, I know it's getting late for you, but it's always a, it's always a treat to talk to you. And, um, okay. Well, you have a good day out there. Uh, dealing with California. Someday, if I ever get to California again, which is very possible because I did grow up there, uh, I will certainly make my way to Sacto. Please and, uh, do. Please do. I will. It will be my treat. I'll take you anywhere yeah. you want to eat. And we'll have a, <laughs> we'll enjoy a meal. I'm sure you'll have much better recommendations and interesting ideas for for where to share our lunch than I would. So. Oh, well, I don't know. It's, uh, I never spent that much time in Sacramento. No, so. but you might not have the place, but you might say, this is the kind of place I want to eat. Or, you right. know, I, I've got some some of my own special spots anyway. But anyway. Sure. Thank you. Take Bert. care, Paul. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>